finish off with um, our project we're doing town just north of Amsterdam, Zandam, where we're working with the local authorities to try and create a resilient urban infrastructure. Uh, next, please. For what is uh, currently um, an undeveloped site next to the town centre. Um, these are sketches at the early stage of, of the design, looking at uh, uh, beginnings of understanding of what these critical forces are. Um, on the right, looking at movement, and that's uh, grown out of work being carried out by the Space Syntax Group at the Bartlett, trying to get effective movement structures across the space. Um, and on the left, um, there is an area of wetlands to the west of the site, which is, has quite important regionally in terms of ecology. Um, but we're next, please. The significance of that really is on the left-hand slide, which is that we are looking at ways in which the water systems for this development can actually contribute to, act with the water systems in the wetlands rather than being segregated from. I'll stop then. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Um, the next speaker is Eileen Fitzgerald. She's uh, an architect who uh, works with the um, Energy Research Group at University College Dublin, uh, where one of the projects was the coordination of the uh, solar house uh, project of, uh, <coughs> that you heard of earlier on. Uh, sponsored by the um, European Commission. Um, several of the presentations that will follow her will refer to it, and we have asked her to also um, discuss uh, some of the projects from uh, partnerships who, were, who could not be uh, here today. Eileen. Okay, can you hear me? Um, I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, Solar House is in itself a misnomer um, because the Solar House program really was a group of um, a group of projects, and not all of them are um, buildings or components either. Um, in fact, uh, now Solar House really consists of about 45 projects. Um, about half of those projects are for buildings and components. Um, at least the support from the European Commission is for the research um, element of, of those, uh, particularly the building, um, the building projects and, and the component development. Um, the remainder of the projects are in fact um, a, a, um, a number of different uh, research projects um, and education projects. And what I'd like to just say is that in talking about the buildings, um, um, which I won't discuss in, in, in detail, what I want to do is just really more emphasize not so much the end product, but in fact the process um, which has been, um, which has resulted uh, in, in the buildings which I'm going to show you. The reason why that's important is because um, some of the uh, concepts that we touched on earlier um, today um, and during this morning um, w w were really to do with how architects anticipate um, the behaviour or the performance um, of the types of strategies that, they're, that they are proposing. It's often very difficult to anticipate and to even, um, not just to anticipate in fact, but to communicate to the clients or to the users of the buildings how the buildings will in fact perform, especially in this kind of area where the kind of um, strategies that we're talking about may often, and materials indeed, may often be um, innovative and, in, and, unte and untested. So really what I want to sort of just try and um, show you and illustrate to you um, is a number of proposals, a number of projects, um, looking at different aspects, making different proposals, um, and analysing the problems in different ways. Okay, so if we can have the first, uh, the second slide, please. Okay. 
Um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with buildings and components projects, but then I'm going to run through and I'm going to show you some of the, um, just really, just literally name, some of the research projects that are in fact um, supporting both this work, but also other work by other architects in the future. The whole, the idea is really to, to, to lend a support structure, to make available a support structure and to communicate the information that is being in fact um, that has been available for a long time from the research community, but to have it in, to, to actually now move that into the realm of the, const of the, um, of, of, of the construction and the making of our buildings. Uh, okay. I think I've dealt with that page. Now, two of the solar house projects are actually located in Berlin. Um, the first one, as you see here, well, in fact, Renzo Piano Building Workshop um, are actually the coordinator for the, they won the competition for the uh, redevelopment of the Potsdamer Platz. Now, their project is the Debus Building, or, or, or at least the um, implementation, let's say, of some of their research um, will be first seen in the Debus Building, which is one of these buildings here. Um, now, if I can have the next slide, uh, which is actually sideways, um, what, what you might be able to see <laughs> if, if you turn around is that what they're looking at is the, um, the implementation of the ventilated facade. Now their concern, one of their interests was in the, um, in the use of this ventilated facade both to trap um, and remove warm air in winter time um, but also uh, as using it as a buffer zone during the summer time. Now in order to do that not only did they use some quite um, advanced um, um, simulation techniques um, in order to look at the kind of problems that this poses, but also they used some very simple um, techniques in their, own, um, in their own office building workshop in, in, in Genoa to try and at a very basic level begin to predict the kind of implications of, um, of, the, of the strategies that they were proposing. Um, now if we can have the next slide, sorry. Uh, back to front. Um, this is also the Potsdamer Platz in, in Berlin um, and where Richard Rogers and partners are working on a series of office blocks. Now what they did was, we can have the next slide, uh, use again um, modelling techniques to, 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 to analyse um, and to assess the behaviour of, um, of both the air uh, the temperature distribution and indeed the daylight and performance within the building. Now, somebody um, from Roger's office is here. They may talk about that later on. Next slide. Okay. Go to the next one. Okay, this is Duisburg. Um, what I should have said really was this particular group of projects are dealing with, um, the reason I've sort of grouped them in this manner is because they're dealing with groups of buildings um, and sort of quite large scale, um, large scale developments. Okay, this is Duisburg in Germany um, where uh, this is the micro, in fact this building here on the right hand side is the microelectronics centre. Um, Fosters have uh, examined this building um, it's, it's organised as a series of, next slide, as a series of office fingers um, which are, uh, which w in which um, atria are inserted. And in fact, one of the sort of potential, one of the real areas of their um, analysis of this building uh, was the shading of the atrium area and the behaviour of the sort of, of, of the, um, the thermal behaviour uh, and indeed the daylighting behaviour of the atrium. Next. I'm going to sort of move quite quickly now. Okay, next. Okay, this is, um, you've seen this before, it's Regensburg. Um, and I think just to mention that this project, in fact, is being carried out um, under the auspices of the REED project. And uh, REED is a kind of a special task force which exists as a solar house project. Um, and it's formed by, uh, the core of which is formed of a group of architects, uh, Fosters, Rogers, um, Thomas Herzog, and, um, and uh, Renzi Piano from Building Workshop. This is one of the, one of the projects um, Hugh has already talked a little bit about this. I won't say much more, but just to say that Reed is also drafting technical guidelines and uh, compiling a charter together with preparing a publication. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, there's a group of buildings which are proposing the renovation of historic structures. Uh, the most interesting of those, and in fact one that I, I, I didn't put in a slide of because I thought Hugh might mention it, was the, uh, the Reichstag. 
Um, this is, in fact, the central market in Athens. Um, the architects in Athens are proposing the renovation of this building using a new, next slide, using um, a new ventilated roof, um, which is, which is cooled, um, which is uh, cooled using evaporative cooling. Next, and um, also shading from using plants. Now, this is actually um, this is a, a computer generated. This is simulation of the behavior of that roof. In fact, the roof. Um, may not be implemented, in fact, as it's proposed, but this is a computer, um, a computer image of the proposal. Okay. Next. Um, this is a sideways view of, um, of uh, a proposal to put a new, um, a new uh, ecological envelope over the archaeological site, which is, uh, it's a Bronze Age site, um, at the, uh, the uh, archaeological dig, um, Akrotiri in Santorini. Um, these are a group of Greek architects who are working, in fact, with Norbert Kaiser um, to propose, again, an, an environmentally, or, um, an evaporatively cooled roof, but using different, a slightly different technique, different strategies, and different forms of analysis. Next. Next, please. Okay. This a group of buildings which, um, in a way, propose rather than rather than isolating, let's say, the facade or the envelope for um, for for analysis, have in fact treated the the bioclimatic design of the buildings um, as 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 their as their um, in a way a more sort of a, a holistic approach to the building. This is one of them. Um, it's a particularly difficult project because it's a a, a project for the design of a 700-bed hospital in the north of Greece, in Thessaloniki. This building has just been, has just been completed. Um, I think any architects here who've ever been involved in the design of a hospital will appreciate the complexity of the requirements of the brief for a hospital, let alone then the, um, the ins if you like, the insertion um, of, 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 of uh, the, the, the strategies such as natural ventilation and daylighting and so on. I mean, the, it, it really... Um, I think the architects found it a, tr a terrific challenge, um, but having said that, uh, have, have, made, have made this proposal, in fact, have now, as I say, constructed the building. Next, please. Okay, this, is, um, th this section shows some of the issues that they, um, that they not just considered, let's say, but analyzed in detail. Uh, the daylighting, the natural ventilation, and the distribution of the air. Cooling, obviously, is a particular problem in, um, in, in, in Greece, in the southern hemisphere in particular. And so, I mean, this was part of the, uh, part of the proposal. Next, please. Um, maybe we'll go to the next slide. This is Focus 21. It's a building in, in Denmark. It's an office building. Um, and the architects took as, uh, I mean, as their starting statement, the reduction of CO2 emissions by 50%. As you can see, this is a fully naturally daylit uh, office building. Next, please. Uh, this is a petrol station. Uh, in fact, a petrol station is probably too limited. It's, it's, it's actually um, a service station by Thomas Herzog um, in Germany uh, using a number of bioclimatic uh, strategies, uh, not to say uh, materials such as timber. Next, please. This is one of a number of proposals which were made for, um, if you like, a kind of uh, envelope. Sort of an all, uh, um, this is called the bioclimatic envelope, and it's um, Francois Jourda and, and uh, Gilles Perrodin. Uh, their proposal here, another building which is going on site very shortly, in fact, proposal for a number of buildings grouped together under a bioclimatic el envelope which modifies the climate. Um, in this case, the envelope is openable um, to sort of at appropriate times of the year. Um, they studied this together with Ovarips, uh, who carried out a number of com computer simulations, both for the, uh, the, the structure of the envelope as well as, as, well as its performance. Next, please. Okay, um, again on the envelope theme, if you like, um, uh, Thomas Herzog's uh, conference centre in Linz, a fully daylit building, um, a kind of reinterpretation of the Crystal Palace theme, which brings with it its own problems in terms of thermal performance, um, which were overcome by uh, the development of these components, as you can see, which are repeated throughout the facade, um, and which reflect, um, which reflect. Uh, 
particular, um, for, 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 which reflect the heating components of, the, of light while allowing in uh, diffuse light into the building. Next, please. The detail of that. Next. Okay. Um, a hop Michael Hopkins, um, John Pringle will be talking later, so I will just say that um, Hopkins were concerned, I think, mainly with the development of strategies for office buildings, particularly in sort of noisy and polluted areas where it's quite difficult to, where natural ventilation and so on doesn't become quite the obvious, the obvious answer. Um, other, other solutions must be found. Um, one of the investigations was, uh, was the, 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 glazed, the glazed envelope. It was interesting that um, Hopkins um, tested uh, prototypes of this, of this glazed envelope in, um, in test cells in Catania in Italy. Um, and then uh, now, in fact, have sort of a section, uh, a sort of larger prototype installed in Catania, be which is being monitored. So again, the kind of idea of not just the prediction, but also the monitoring of the, be of the behavior of these kind of components and elements becomes very important. Next, please. Okay, so passes. Next. Uh, just to say that a number of the a number of projects cover the uh, development of PV um, of PV panels for insertion into uh, building envelopes. Next, we we'll go on through these, just to show these examples. Okay, keep going. Okay. Okay. Now, just to, to note that a number of the, as I mentioned earlier, a number of the. Um, a number of the uh, projects are actually to develop tools which assist in the design of buildings. One of them is PASCU, um, which is a southern European project, which really, which really is, is more involved in the area of natural cooling of buildings. There are a number of um, computer programs which are available which are as a result of the work carried out in this program. So, next. Okay, next. Um, there's a daylighting. I think I just um, I'm doing for time. Uh, there's, I should mention that one of the projects um, is called Daylight Europe, and Daylight Europe. It was a, a European group which a few years ago published a daylighting handbook, um, but now is a kind of in a way as a result of that, 18 teams are collaborating on a three-year project, and the objective of this project is to actually produce guidelines on the integration of daylighting technologies um, in non-domestic buildings. Next, please. Okay, there's a project also to produce a daylighting atlas. Next, please. Um, I'd like to mention just very briefly that the Energy Research Group, although we, in fact, our role in the Solar House is not, in fact, to coordinate the project, um, we are um, simply um, a member, we're mem simply um, contractors um, in the project. Our role, um, both in the past and at the moment, has tended to be one which is with the coordina coordination of support to architects who are involved in, um, in, these, in these new areas of design of, um, of our buildings. Um, in the past, Solinfo, which is the, um, the title of the, the, proje the, the, the project that we work under, um, has been responsible for a number of, for a number of publications um, of educational material. I'm just going to flick through those, and that's it. Okay, there are a um, series of posters, um, exhibitions. We can keep going. Uh, primer, which is sideways, but it's a competition for passive cooling, which was, which was held about um, a year ago now. Next. Um, this is educational material, which is produced, um, which has just recently been issued um, to schools of um, to schools of architecture. Simas was um, involved in one of the three packages. There's educational um, buildings, um, tertiary buildings, and uh, uh, domestic and domestic buildings. We were responsible just simply for the domestic building package um, of of the um, of the of the work. Next, please. And next. Uh, this is a book which was a direct result um, of the work carried out at that time, and it's uh, just available now, I think. Next, please. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, as Eileen mentioned, uh, our, our group in the graduate school was involved in the uh, production of one of those um, uh, 
packages, in fact, the one she showed, and all three, all three of those packages um, have been uh, at the AA library. Uh, also, that our group in the graduate school was involved in the um, uh, past school research uh, project, and uh, all the computer programs produced uh, within that project, worth, I think, 130 megabytes, are now running on our computer computers at the AA. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dennis Ho. He's an architect with uh, Richard Rogers uh, Partnership specializing in low energy uh, design issues. Good afternoon. Um, actually, I've only joined Richard Rogers Partnership two years ago, and I think when, when I was a student two or three years ago uh, working with Dean Hawks and Nick Baker, uh, you understand that there are lots of possibilities with low energy building design. And it all seemed very confusing at the time. There's so many, so many things you can do and so many products, so many new technologies that you can apply to building. And although I was very confused about the whole process, I would, I see, I'm still very keen on exploring how the process actually works within low energy design. And when I joined Richard Rogers' office, and I have to really encounter this problem, and it, it's become even more confusing when you have to actually design a real project, which is going to cost the client a lot of money, and you really don't want to waste too much time doing it. And in order to get it right, the process is very important, and I have to say that a lot of the engineers have been doing very well in supporting the process. Can I have the first slide, please? This is one of the office buildings that we're designing on Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. And as Eileen mentioned earlier on, um, the master plan is being done by Renzo Piano Workshop and Kobecker. Uh, on this side, we have very strict planning and cost constraint. And the master plan actually defines the size of the block and that it has to be a courtyard building. And what we're trying to do is actually within this constraint, somehow try to find a way in order to achieve not just architectural criteria, but also um, a very low energy target that we have set for the building as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, it, it was very confusing studying um, environmental design, knowing that there are so many options. But I think it became quite clear working on this building that um, you, have to, you have to take um, the problem step by step. And I'm going to show this project step by step to show how it's actually being done and well, what's going to look like in a moment. Can I have this next slide, please? The first step that we took is actually to look at the building form and say we have this constraint on, on site. What can we do about it? Well, as you can see, these are the three office buildings, and they face us on the park, and the orientation of, of, the, of the front of the building, buildings are actually facing southeast. So what, what we're saying is, why don't we open up the front of the building to let in more daylight and more solar gain in the winter? And on top of that, because the, the master plan actually said there has to be a courtyard building, and a courtyard building actually increases um, the amount of facades and therefore heat loss in winter. And what we've decided to do to do after a series of analysis is to actually turn the courtyard building into an atrium. And at the beginning, we look at how actually daylight would, would be changed by turning the courtyard building into a kind of an open, open building in the front. And you can see, you can, you can see that here, th um, the day, daylight contours are mapped out on a, on a building plan. And I think if we didn't have the building open up at the front, there was going to be a very, very little amount of sunlight and daylight going into the center of the courtyard. So that the decision that we've taken is actually based on um, looking at daylight levels within the courtyard and solar gain as well. Uh, next, please. Um, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned that we decided to go for an atrium solution. And as Nick Baker will probably tell, tell everybody here, um, the, the thermal benefits of an atrium um, is, is it's great. I mean, the potential is there, but actually, to, to make it work, a lot of work has to be done to make sure that it actually doesn't consume energy. Um, so what we're trying to do is, we're trying to naturally ventilate the whole building, and we have done a lot of analysis, uh, CFD analysis, to show how temperature within the building 
changes from, from lower level to the upper level and to make sure that all the conditions in the rooms are correct. And in the end, we, we come up with a solution where we inserted a, a plenum between the, the shopping mall uh, at the two bottom two levels and an office block. And the outlets are specially designed in a way so that air, air movement flow along the facades of the building and therefore enhancing the natural ventilation within the offices. And again, within the process, we have to find some way to decide you know, where, where should we place the outlets? What, what is the area that is required? And after, I mean, we, we, we have done quite a lot of work. I mean, just, no, just, just to get all this right is really, 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 really a lot of work. And as a student, you, you, you kind of think that you can actually apply your first, first principle to, to a building. Say, I want to put a build, an atrium within a building and it will work. And it's really not as straightforward as that. And this is a photograph showing what the atrium is, um, is going to be like. It's, it's a model shop. Next one, please. Um, the, the atrium was um, part of the strategy to reduce energy consumption, to minimize uh, heat loss, and actually to make use of um, passive solar gain. Now, moving away from, from the atrium and the building as a whole, we, we then moved to our second stage, which is, which is to look at the, the facades of the building. Um, the one of the problems with office buildings in urban sites is um, cooling load. And we all know that uh, air conditioning are often used in offices in urban sites. Uh, what we're trying to do here is actually to look at a facade. Very specifically, we have actually looked at each room individually and look at the solar gain on each facade and to say which facade actually requires solar shading. For example, one of the, first, the first step we took is we actually look, look, look at the facade with clear glazing and we say we have identified problems around here and we think that we, we need external shading there. And the next step is actually to cut down cooling low even further. How, how do we deal with the problem? Okay, we can add solar shading step by step onto the facades. But even that is not good enough because, the, I mean, even that, the, the cooling low required is you, you have to have air conditioning. You can't have uh, chill ceilings in it. So what we're doing is for step three, we're actually putting in some of the special glazing. And as you can see, maybe the diagram is a bit too small, but if you can see from here that actually the, the types of panel changes on, on each uh, bay um, according to the, uh, solar, uh, the uh, criteria, the thermal criteria performance. And the shading requirement also changes. I think some of the shading are deeper than the others. And you, you sometimes you get horizontal shading, and sometimes you get vertical shading, depending on, on the orientation of the facade as well. Um, this, is, this is a model showing how it is looking at the moment. And I think eventually we, we managed to, to get rid of all the external shading. And we, now we have a solution where we actually have um, built-in panels which perform like external shading. And again, the use of panels here depending on the ori orientation of and the location of the facade. And here is the, the plenum into, into the atrium that I mentioned earlier on. And the next one, please. Looking, looking at the, fa the, the facade um, as well as the inside of the building, one really has to make sure that the, not only the facade works in terms of controlling solar gain, but you also have to make sure that air movement within the building works well because we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve is um, a fully natural ventilated building. And there are many ways to um, design the window so that natural ventilation can be achieved within the room. But what we've done is actually we've taken a serious CFD analysis and to look at various options and to decide you know, which is the most appropriate in terms of cost and uh, window configuration. And I think eventually we come up with a solution where we have a top opening window and bot bottom split one, uh, which uh, relates to security and control and other various things as well. So, uh, I mean, you can see the, the whole design's actually evolved from first looking at the, the building form, opening up the, the building, creating an atrium in the middle um, to increase the solar gain in winter, and then we move on to look at the facade, how to actually control uh, solar gain, uh, therefore reducing cooling load. And then we move on into the room itself to make sure that air movement within the room is, um, is suitable for the occupants inside. Can you have the next one, please? <laughs> right, I've been told it's time's up. So I'll very quickly sum up that. I, I think, I mean, as I said, it's, it was very confusing. But I, I mean, after doing this, I, I you know, realized that is 
this step-by-step -step process is actually very important for, for one to understand because there's so many things you can do and you can't apply everything to a building design. I think for, for a student, or, or even when I was a student, you know, it's, it's impossible to try to understand how all these things can be put together and come up with a low energy building. Um, but I think we, we're quite satisfied that after taking the four steps, the four basic steps, we come up with um, a solution which has um, energy consumption, which is about 30% of what is t uh, typically required in an office building in Berlin. And the next one, please. Again, this is an animal mo model shot showing the rotunda. Be there is um, the, meet the meeting rooms are in the rotunda at the front, and the office block that steps back to allow more daylight into the atrium. And you can see this is the main entrance in the atrium as well. And then this is the, the air plenum uh, used to naturally ventilate the atrium itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, John, John Pringle is the next speaker. He's a partner with uh, Sir Michael Hopkins and Partners. He's been involved in low energy research developed within the practice and will be talking about it. And of course, as you all know, he's the immediate past president of AAA. the slide up, <coughs> please. What I'm going to talk about is more the process and uh, rather than the actual buildings themselves. And I think what we've tried to focus on in our EC Jewel 2 research program is trying to make the technology of a sustainable architecture a tool and not a master of the architecture. And I think it's quite a an imposition on the on the architecture. You see all the examples of low energy buildings where you have the tyranny of the south facing conservatories and the super insulated north facades and the buildings contorted around orientation and the sun. But the, re the reality is that most of our projects are urban sites which are considerably more difficult than that. Also we are quite keen not to develop a, a architecture where you have all these devices plastered over the building like badges on a Boy Scout's arm with these sort of solar collectors and PV cells and wind generators all slapped on the outside of the building. We wanted to inflect the, the building itself and make it into, and reconfigure what you've already got in the building to make it more energy efficient. I think a lot of people forget that it, there isn't just one issue which is low energy. There, there are, when you're designing a building, there's a whole host of issues like planning, heritage concerns, the economics, the viability of the, of the building, durability of the building, clients' requirements. And you can't just isolate one, one thing and make that dominate the design. You've got to keep all the balls in the air at the same time. And then we, in this research, we wanted to then enhance, see if we could enhance the vocabulary. We were very good at um, uh, reflecting the structural performance of the building, that you could straight, um, trace the movement of structural forces through the slabs and down the elevations of the building and that became part of the architecture. And what we wanted to discover is how the movement of, uh, therm of um, heat and in and out of the building and through the, the, the building and the movement of air through the building could influence the, the architecture. And uh, the principal project that we've done research on is this one here, which is the parliamentary building. This is just one bay. It's a sort of, uh, it's an enormous model we built. And in fact, there's something like um, over a dozen bays like that that make up the whole building. It's a big courtyard building. And um, we, because it had a relatively long gestation period and there was a design, it, in fact, it's not going to start on site until uh, a year from now because of the tube station development underneath. We um, had the opportunity to feed the results of the, of the re research into it. And what, what you have here is an incredibly highly integrated building where the structure and the services are all very interrelated and uh, what, what we developed was um, a lot of uh, devices like um, a ventilated facade. We, we tried to uh, make Le Corbusier's neutralizing facade work in conjunction with the, um, with, with the what he called the respiration exact, the sort of air conditioning of, of, of the day that he tried to develop for the Salvation Army at hospital. And uh, we tried to make, it, make a wall that is basically a, a, a glass and metal wall work in the, in the, as a neutralizing wall. I think that one of the problems is that most of the time, you, you, in order to make the building energy efficient, you're really shutting out the outside world. And you see a lot of buildings that um, exclude the outside environment, and you're left with this terrible interior. What we're trying to develop was some 
freedom where you could have energy efficiency without that sort of penalty. Um, so we, we set out the constraints we had were high density sites. You didn't have choice of orientation. There'd be buildings. It's the problem of skyscrapers or cities where you have this high density um, uh, streets where there's very little separation between buildings. There aren't natural resources to use because they're overshadowed by, by buildings opposite. Um, the, you, uh, in fact, the heat internal gains, unlike the, build, the houses outside in the country, um, are, are not an advantage. They create problems because cooling is the problem of these buildings. You've also got the problem of expectations. People are incredibly demanding about urban buildings. They somehow, they expect them to be air conditioned. They expect not to have to wait more than 30 seconds for a, for a lift. Now when they go home, they wait five minutes for a bus or 10 minutes or quarter an hour for a bus in the street. They don't mind that. They go to a home that's not air conditioned that gets hotter when the day is hotter and cooler when the day is cooler. So um, the, the, there's a partly a cultural problem that people have this, sort of, and it's more to do with probably dissatisfaction with their work environment rather than the buildings themselves. And what we found is that we don't um, have a very good knowledge of, of buildings. And what we managed to do on this project was to get a very uh, close knowledge of how it works thermally. And here, here you can see that the um, the slabs inside the building are part of thermal capacitors that work with a displacement ventilation system in the rooms, which in turn allows you to use groundwater for cooling without you, the use of any, any refrigerants. And the fact, and the architecture you get out of that is that you have to expose your structural slabs, which are waveform slabs, and um, you have to strip away all the finishes that sort of um, do so little to help the thermal performance of buildings. If you strip those finishes away and reveal what's underneath, you can actually deploy it as part of the um, a, a very efficient thermal system. And in this building we have, you can see the structure diminishes in thickness, all the columns diminish in thickness as you go towards the top of the uh, building. And the ducts on either side of each window increase in width as they go towards the air plant at the top. And all the air rises up towards these chimneys which are air intakes to take the fresh air up at high level um, at the, at the bottom, and there are <coughs> exhausts at the top and a thermal wheel in, in between, which allows you, at the base of the chimney, which allows you to recover the energy. So in a way, we've got an architecture, a new form of chimneys, which are to do with the problems of office buildings in the, in the 1990s, which is um, every bit as expressive as the chimneys on the Norman Shore building that's next door to the site of the new parliamentary building. I'll just take you briefly through the research that we did, and we worked with Ovarapin partners, and. Um, and um, also a, a test laboratory in Sicily called Confavors, and Bart and Bach were lighting engineers. And then later on, we worked with um, uh, CSTB in Nantes in France um, on, wind, on a further stage of research on wind tunnel testing. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? And uh, you've seen this slide before. It's John Berries of the um, analysis and the, one of the problems is trying to make the design tool simple because this is an incredibly costly process you can't afford to do on every project we're trying to learn about how this wall this um, uh, these buildings perform and how they behave and try and reduce them to much simpler design tools so you, d you don't have to run a CFD calculation computation that lasts for days on end just to, to find out what happens in, in, w in one window that you could somehow reduce it down and develop simpler algorithms as to how the, how the fabric of the building performs. So th this was one big part of the research, to try and develop these simpler design tools. But the other part, if we can have the, ne the next slide, was um, physical testing. And this is the first stage of tests in a test cell in Catania, where, we, where you have two English summers every year, as opposed to one unreliable one here in England. So you can, you can test the uh, performance of the, uh, of the wall. And we, we kept we te really tested the ventilated facade with blinds, and, and we, it was quite interesting that it actually informed how the mathematicians did their calculations, because they, they realized that, that, that by seeing smoke tests, how the, um, how the air actually flows over the blind blades. And uh, I think there's some skepticism as to the use of these tests at the beginning, but in fact they proved to show the, how everything interacts together. Next slide, please. And then we went on to build in, in the test building on the, in fact, there's a very simplified, rather crude version, the nearest of the sort of four bays on the main block, with a um, simulation of, of, the f of the facade, and um, we monitored it in real use. 
so that you could sort of see how the structure and the thermal mass inside the building interact with it. And th this proved to be extremely useful. And we then carried out other experiments on um, with uh, more naturally um, ventilated uh, configurations. Next slide, please. And then we carried out, as a second stage of research, some work on using PV cells as, um, and I think people think PV cells, you know, they sound nice, they, they, ge they generate a lot of electricity, but in fact, 85% of what they generate is heat. Only 15% of the solar energy comes off as electricity. So we regarded them principally as hot air collectors, but incidentally, they would generate some electricity that you could use to power fans that could power your shaded facade on the other side of the building. So we could once again free up our city buildings from orientation. You could, in, in one device, you could uh, provide the motive force for ventilating the building on two facades at once. So this, we in, again in Sicily, we carried out these tests on PV cells to monitor how they work as warm air collectors, as uh, ventilators, as well as, um, as well as electricity generators, because really the electricity is only a minor part of the performance of this configuration here. N next slide, please. And then uh, as looking at more speculative work, what would we do to this parliamentary building to make it yet more energy efficient? And we were developing these um, ventilation terminals on the roof in the CSTB um, wind tunnel. It's the m biggest wind tunnel in the world in, um, in Nantes, which are, and all the people there shout at the top of their voices because they spend their whole time sh shouting against the, against the wind. But they, they, put these, they carried out these mock-ups where we were trying to use, um, develop chimneys that would work under any wind direction and a very, you know, with very low pressure ventilation systems. And they, they, they constructed them these and we carried out a number of, a number of tests and uh, also to assess the reliability of wind in an urban environment. And the next slide, please. And finally, th this is a sort of very crude model and it's not, not architecture, but it's, it contains a lot of the sort of devices that we might use on, on future projects. And, and we're gaining a lot of confidence about how you can, um, not only how you can make the building more efficient, uh, and s that it consumes less energy and works as an organism, which is, is well understood. And, uh, you know, like it's like having a, a car and a, if you don't have a good transmission or the gears are, is the gears are wrong, then it won't work, work very well. You've got to have a good delivery system that can use the prime source of energy and deliver it efficiently. And what most buildings are, you've, your people are concentrating on harvesting the energy but not actually delivering it in a very effective way. So we're saying let's deliver it in an effective way and then let's see what we can use in terms of the natural energy sources. And this shows a series of flues running up the, the building uh, with buoyancy of ventilation which is wind assisted and there'll be PV panels on the roof that can um, power the, the shaded facade on the other side. As I say, these are we're developing these almost in isolation to try and understand how the um, how the building works as a, as, an, as, a, as a mechanism that we can then use it with some confidence and not be dominated by the, the needs for to make the architecture more energy efficient. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, can I have the first slide? When we go through um, so many projects in uh, such a rapid pace, it uh, becomes sometimes very difficult to uh, identify the questions. So I've taken the liberty to uh, produce some remarks in response to the topic of this session, appropriate technology, what is possible today, and taking on um, some of the issues and concerns which were raised already by the previous speakers. I've titled my remarks, The Demise of Brute Force Engineering and the New Beginning for Architectural Technology. The uh, text, which I shall more or less read, uh, is accompanied by seven slides, which extend the text rather than illustrate or clarify it. I shall not be referring to them. The dividing line between architecture and engineering has disappeared. Much of what was known as services engineering has gone with it. Today, it is possible to design buildings with little or no dependence on fossil fuel energy, either in embodied energy or for building use. This follows 
from natural environmental attributes of architectural forms and constructional elements. Forms and elements can be made to respond to daily and seasonal natural cycles and exploit ambient energy sources and sinks in serving occupant comfort and functional requirements. Next slide, please. A shared science has evolved. It deals with spatial and temporal interactions in natural and man-made environments. These are interactions which affect use, comfort and enjoyment of space, outdoors as well as indoors. Today, this shared science underpins the revival of architectural technology. Next slide, please. To strive for zero fossil fuel energy for all building types in all climates is a global objective. On the other hand, architectural technology, the main means for achieving this objective, must be contextual knowledge and appropriate technique. Its design vocabulary should be informed by climate, site, building type, and design brief. Appropriateness requires that we ask and answer the questions where, when, for whom, for what, for how long, and of course also why. The architecture of sustainability is one of diversity. There are no predetermined solutions. Next slide. There are millions of buildings in which thermal and visual comfort are not achieved despite the very large amounts of energy use. These show how difficult architecture is to sustain when its fabric and implantation on site ignore or defy climate, environment and occupants. There are challenging design opportunities in converting such buildings and dramatic improvements in performance can be achieved. Next slide, please. Today, every new building or retrofit is claimed to be environment friendly and as low energy as can be. How real are such claims? How credible are predictions made at the design stage? What kind of differences do we observe between design prediction and operational reality? How low is low energy? What targets should be aimed at? How often updated? There is continuing discourse but no universally accepted, all-encompassing assessment of architectural performance, impact, or quality in the environment. Next slide, please. An architectural language of sustainable design is evolving. It relies on three complementary ways of knowing, learning, and comparative assessment. Firstly, through the cognitive feel for the natural environmental attributes of architectural forms and constructional elements as these manifest themselves in different climates and on different building types. Secondly, through empirical knowledge based on experience in buildings as well as on measurement. And thirdly, through modeling and simulation which are means of informing design and assessing buildings in practice. Jointly, these provide objective criteria for a new, crucial new dimension in architectural criticism. Next slide, please. This is probably the first time this century we have the knowledge, means, and perhaps reason to be objective as well as optimistic about architecture. It may be just possible today shall be remembered as the best time ever to study and practice it. Thank you. Could the panel comment on the fact that the design and the capital cost of buildings which are more sustainable appear to be higher at the moment 
or is this just a temporary thing until we learn the technology? Brian, Brian wanted to make a comment. Wait, wait, sorry, Brian. Because uh, you probably know that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to the, the hypothesis. It does depend on who your client is and where your building is. And if it's oppo opposite the current Houses of Parliament, then I'm sure there are constraints which go beyond the realm in which I deal with anyway. But uh, certainly uh, the projects that I showed, firstly the brewery, there was no mechanical plant for moving air around so in other words we just left it out uh, so that does actually represent a saving of course maybe there are there are expenses on the building itself which I I increase but in the case of the brewery building the, the engineering plant that went into it cost three times as much as the building fabric uh, in terms of the engineering school at Leicester um, that cost round about £850 a square metre. Now, um, my colleagues here will know how much their buildings cost, but... Um, uh, it, and I, I think it is... Uh, it, that's not saying that um, <laughs> mechanical ventilation necessarily is going to cause cost more or be more energy intensive, and, and there are examples, of course, as you know, that don't. But I, I think the thesis is incorrect and I think somebody earlier said that they had a great deal of problem actually convincing their clients to pursue this route and I think it partly is because there seems to be this misconception that if we do try to save energy or we try to take an environmentally responsible stance then it's going to cost more and who, which client is going to take that route? Of course they won't and one of the things I wanted to say is that we may have been lucky, but certainly our clients have been, have welcomed our approach. Uh, because in general, their buildings don't cost more. We can uh, reduce running costs, we can reduce maintenance costs, and uh, clients are very interested in capital savings, maintenance savings, running cost savings. And if you approach it like that, which client is going to say no? Thanks, Brian. Design time is a problem, and I'd also agree with Edward Goldsmith, who said that there is a danger that anybody who is going to be employed in the future is going to work for slave wages, and I think we all know what that means. Okay, jo John Berry and Nick Baker will comment also on this same question. John? Yeah, I, I think there's a danger of confusing cost with value. Um, I, I would say that in terms of value, the buildings are, 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 are cheaper, if that's the right word, because in... in um, um, life cycle cost and they will come out much, much better. And then, of course, you're into that very difficult area of how do you put a value on environmental concerns. The, just but taking, you know, the reality that we live in today and trying to get these buildings um, off the starting blocks, I think it's reasonable to say that they're certainly not cheaper than a conventional building. Whether they're more expensive is, is debatable. I, I don't think they are. And the reason that... Um, they are not cheaper is because it's not simply a matter of leaving things out. Um, because if you leave out the services, you tend to have to improve the performance of the rest of the building 
particularly the facade. So it's rather like a, a pack of cards. Um, uh, the, the dollar sign is the same against the pack. You, you just shuffle it in a different way. Yes, I'd just like to, to point out that um, energy costs in buildings are very small compared with staff costs. And I believe, and I think we all believe, that passive design, which is low energy design, also carries great advantages in terms of the well-being of the occupants. And so a 10% reduction in, in staff absenteeism is worth an enormous amount of energy saving in pure um, money terms. So I do believe that when uh, approaching a client and persuading them to take a kind of passive bioclimatic path, we shouldn't just concentrate on, on energy saving. Thank you, Nick. Other questions? Having made all the e energy savings, how many of you have actually made gains? Is it possible to have a building that makes more energy than, than, than is saved, considering how much savings that you've been making so far? Uh, any, anyone who would like to comment on buildings as energy producers? I, I think I, I'd say something there, that, that that is a very difficult problem. And it was the point I was trying to make, that um, if you put individual buildings which are energy efficient or produce their own energy into an urban framework, then the sum of those parts isn't necessarily going to add up to um, what you expected. And they, they will fight with each other and they will overshadow each other and they will act in different ways. If you, however, think of those buildings together and, um, thank you, and, and consider how they can uh, support each other in generating electricity to meet their own needs, then you begin to get a, a different sort of uh, equation working for you. The question then is, once you've generated, if you can generate more energy than you need, what are you going to do with it? I mean, if you're going to generate more heat than you can usefully use through absorption chilling machines to, to cool um, other functions in that complex of buildings, what do you do with it? You know, who's going to take it from you? It's your problem. Um, is there a way of working with those, um, those sorts of energy producing ideas and being creative in the, the building uses and the way we use the energy so that where we do have an excess, we can use it usefully somewhere else? Yeah, but we, did, we, we did see, I think, that with uh, Brenda Bale's example, where there's a, an exchange with the grid and which probably will continue, but that perhaps is an issue hmm. for the next session. Uh, can uh, I also call up on Eileen? Uh, we're just trying to move through the questions quickly. Could you speak close to the microphone? It is working. They're all working. <laughs> no, what I wanted to say, and I'm sure it's, it's maybe not a direct answer to your question, but what I, what, I, what I think is important, and we haven't touched really on it so far, is the importance of monitoring. I mean, that's to say that the process of designing a building and understanding how it's going to work, maybe predicting how it's going to work, doesn't end with the occupation of the building by the client or by the, by the inhabitants. In fact, it's got to go further than that, and it's got to go into the realms of actual, of, of monitoring of the, the, the behavior of the actual building, the building as constructed um, in the environment cons uh, uh, where it's on, on site, but, uh, and also user feedback, so that the, the full circle is then I is then completed, <laughs> and that then we have a means, um, not just of anticipating the desired or the predicted performance, but in fact, uh, in fact, of noting what the actual results are. And I, it's just important to say that 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 that, that that's must be part of the process in order for us to sort of move forward um, and and be able to anticipate what's I the, 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 the 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 what's happening. Thank you, Eileen. Is that satisfactory answers? Or would you like to come back later? We can come back to this question. Gustav? Yes. Well, well, this afternoon is significant in relation to the first session where on a number of occasions in the discussion and in the papers, the question of responsibility, social interaction. This afternoon, we had architects speaking on their work, the egocentric presentation of fights for survival uh, in a competitive world. I'm, I'm not criticizing, I'm trying to look at it objectively. Now, uh, particularly in the case of the uh, Daimler-Benz 
uh, presentation. Now, first of all, you completely left out any political, any broad economic aspect. You just talk of a building and you try to sell us that this is going to be a fine, an exceptionally fine, ecologically sound building. That was your aim and you succeeded extremely well. Now, what you didn't say was that this particular project is ex has been for years a fighting topic in Berlin. Yes, there's been enormous protests against the building, allowing Daimler-Benz, uh, uh, a symbolic place in the heart of Berlin. You didn't say anything about that dispute, hot political potato, which is, will go on for, for a long, long time. And, and uh, so that is something we have to bear in mind. You are saying, and broadly speaking, when I say you, all of you are saying, if we reduce energy, if we act ecologically, we're doing good. But it's not the case, because most of these projects, uh, and certainly the Diamond Benz, is to build up the prestige of powerful industries, in the case of Daimler Benz, one of the most destructive industries in the world, and interestingly enough, it is failing. It is failing on the markets. It's almost collapsing because they try to incorporate the motor car with the defense, with, with, with aeroplanes, bombs and all that, and it's failing financially just as well. Now, I do believe that as architects, uh, this should be discussed, and because it isn't discussed, my view is that architecture isn't really worth practicing. It's hardly worth studying, <laughs> and unless there is a fundamental shift in uh, schools like this, where the economics, the political, the symbolic, the broadly social comes in, certainly this discussion will have no future. Thank you. <coughs> Dennis, would you care to comment? Um. <laughs> I think the, the comments um, is very, very interesting. Um, I think what, what we're trying to do in Daimler Benz is actually tr somehow we need to learn about the process of low energy design. And I think it, it is, I mean, what you said is, is correct. But I think we, I mean, in a way, what the practice is trying to do is to use a building in order to test some of the ideas and some of the analysis and how to apply these uh, principles to, to the building. Um, I mean, it's a, it's it's a very it's a difficult question to answer. But I mean, I myself, I I you know, two years ago, I was still you know studying, learning about environmental design, and didn't realize that you know there's so many so many things that get involved in it. But one, I mean, one should actually start by looking at the the building, say you know what how how I mean we we have to design a building there. You know, the client wants a building there. What what is the best way? to design it. Can we learn something about it? You know, can we can we actually within the development of the design, you know, what what are the new things that we can discover and hopefully try to apply this to other development and to turn those buildings into a more appropriate development, if you like. Can you quickly answer you see this principle goes on through history and if I'm not making any analogy between Nazi Germany and present scale architecture, the fact is in the Nazi camps and in Nazi hospitals, not just the death camps, the doctors, genuine doctors, who said, by studying these uh, reforms, uh, you know, whatever, by, by subjecting people to pressure of water and cold, we are learning about the human body, which can then be applied in our hospitals to treat good, pure Germans or anybody in the world. The principle, you see, is just that. The principle of saying, because we can get some technical advance. Therefore, regardless of morality, regardless of social and political problems, we are justified in going there, is, of, is fundamentally suspect, if not to be totally rejected. Please bear that in mind. This principle. <laughs> I don't think that we will. I don't think that the discussion here was about the supremacy of the technology. It was, I, I don't think that anybody was putting any techro technocratic uh, criteria uh, in, in front. Um, I think b many times, of, I mean, I, I'm not the one who will want to defend architects, I don't think. But um, <coughs> on the other hand, I don't think that um, uh, explicitly one would have gone out to, um, um, to mislead. There is a level of complexity, there is a level of complexity which I have tried to, to bring together in my remarks, which defies the understanding that we have individually. Many people have spoken about the, the 
the, the satisfaction with the teamwork. The, the, or maybe satisfaction is not the word. The, the, the fact that they were feeling a bit more secure in dealing with topics which are not yet widely understood. It's a struggle. And they're trying to appropriate inside the craft of architecture things which come from other disciplines. You would appreciate. Well, could I just right. briefly, since I feel that one should respond to your challenge because, of course, um, we are all faced with both an ethical uh, uh, dilemma and also a, a our work. If it doesn't in include uh, an ethical framework or indeed, to my view, a spiritual dimension, then it will be lacking. But I th personally, in terms of the contrast between this morning when we're looking at global issues and this afternoon where we're perhaps stupidly suggesting solutions. The contrast is enormous, and uh, I would say, personally say we were set up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but also, more seriously, we're in a stage of transition. And Nick Baker, I, I know, was interested in these issues 20 years ago, as I was as a student, and as many of us were too. And we've, uh, for those of you who were also around there, <laughs> will remember that things have there has been quite a transition in that time and we, we've got a huge long way to go and in fact John Berry at lunchtime was saying when he thinks of all, all the buildings that have been involved in it, kind of the effects are kind of tiny and of course they are, all our effects are tiny but maybe it will be... <laughs> yeah, we thought it was a blip on a blip on a blip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would suggest that we take one more question. I'm not trying to evade the discussion at all, uh, but just to, um, I mean, I, I see tired faces. I think we will need a break. And then just to say that the, the, the final session has fewer, much fewer presentations and much more time for discussion on everything that we've covered. So let's have a final question, if you like, on this one. Bill? Bill, you do need you do need the microphone because people can't hear you. He said, "How close are we to achieve zero energy buildings?" Um, the second part of the question is: presumably, any building can be zero energy if you have enough photovoltaics per meter squared of floor area. And the third aspect would be: nobody talked about the embodied energy content. Um, on their technical solutions. And there really has to be a relationship between embodied energy content and the uh, environmental performance of all of these buildings. <laughs> Nick. Well, in, in answer to, you, to your first question, um, I think it's interesting to note that in a survey of energy use in office buildings that was carried out in the last four years, their range of energy use ranged over a factor of 20. The worst buildings you were using 20 times as much energy as the best. So if we if we reframe that question and say how near to zero en zero energy buildings we can get, then we must be able to say quite a long way because the norm was 10 times worse than the best. And I think that it's uh, it would be quite shocking if we stopped 90 cars down the motorway and found that their energy consumption varied by a factor of 20 to one. But this is the case with buildings. So I think that by not particularly advanced technology, we can actually greatly improve the energy performance of all our buildings. To get to zero energy maybe is not so important. We can generate some energy. What we're, what we're looking for is perhaps a zero fossil energy economy, not necessarily zero energy buildings on an indivi individual basis. Okay, I, pr I, I propose that we do take a break now. Uh, that it, it, it oh, okay. Uh, I to say earlier, I left some flyers um, about publications that we supply in Dublin on the table. Anybody who's interested should just pick one up. Okay, uh, thank you. We take a break of 10 minutes, just 10 minutes exactly. Firstly, I, I, I was asked to introduce myself, um, so I've been sitting quietly in a dark corner all day. My name's Dean Hawkes. I'm an architect. I teach at the Welsh School of Architecture in Cardiff. For 30 years until last summer, I taught and researched 
in what I would broadly term the environmental field at Cambridge. I also build a bit, try to take theory into practice, and I also write a little bit on many issues, but often on environmental questions. I'll put in a, a little plug for my own latest book, which came out last month, called <laughs> The Environmental Tradition, but I'll say no more about that. Um, I think so far been in a fascinating day. This session has the kind of intimidating title of the future, where do we go now? Um, what we will do is that I will make a small contribution of my own and then the four panelists here, all of whom have spoken already, will say something. They won't say what they said earlier. Um, they will refresh that and open it up. I think the emphasis in this final session should be on debate. I've also been asked by the organizers to say that the bar will be open at the end of this session for those of you who want to continue the debate in that setting. Um, I don't think I'd want to put a, a guillotine on, on the time of this, of this session, but perhaps we should try to finish by five at the very latest. I'm very anxious to find out what happened to Cambridge United this afternoon. Um, <laughs> and Cardiff City, of course. <clears throat> My contribution, uh, I would like to, 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 to offer it as, as a speculation, not a prescription. And listening to what's transpired so far today, um, I've been very touched by the question of the, the question of the city, whether sustainability is an urban issue or not. I see it as profoundly an urban issue, and that's really the question I want to address in this, I hope, brief contribution. I'll effectively read the text. <coughs> I'll, those of you who know me know that I fairly notoriously sometimes improvise, but I, there will, this will be a performance of the notes on the page and no cadenzas, as far as I'm able. In the city in history, Lewis Mumford wrote, the chief function of the city is to convert power into form, energy into culture, dead matter into the living symbols of art, biological reproduction into social creativity. The positive function of the city cannot be performed without creating new institutional arrangements capable of coping with the vast energies modern man now commands. Arrangements just as bold as those that originally transformed the overgrown village and its stronghold into the nucleated, highly organized city. He wrote that in 1961. Of course, he was very unaware of the particular themes of the environmental debate which have occupied us today and which have evolved very much since. In my memory, the publication of Limits to Growth and the so-called energy crisis of the early 1970s. In the past 25 years, and I think we've seen very much of this today in some of the presentations, <coughs> we've learned a great deal about the means by which buildings and the other tools of our society can be made less wasteful of energy, and about the potential of so-called alternative sources of energy. This knowledge now informs much of conventional practice. Even the most ordinary buildings are energy efficient in comparison with their counterparts of 25 years ago. Just observing the building regs does that. They're not good enough, but that is an astonishing transformation for those of you who are too young to have experienced it yourself in your own practical lives. <coughs> and the best practice now exceeds the performance of those buildings by orders of magnitude. And again, we've seen that a number of times in these histograms which have been on the screen. But all of this achievement has hardly made an impact on the primary global issues. And we've certainly not achieved a transformation of fundamental thought of the magnitude proposed by Mumford. Kind of slightly ironically, I think, economic stagnation in the old world has brought some constraint to physical growth and might even have created conditions for environmentally thoughtful building and development. But anyone who's seen the burgeoning cities of the Pacific Rim, and I, last week I came back from my first ever visit to Southeast Asia. I, I'm, profoundly affected by it, and it would take me a long time to make sense. But anybody who's seen those cities must despair at the lack of such awareness as these emerging economies pursue image at the expense of responsibility. 
I thought when I w went to Kuala Lumpur, I would see every skyscraper being designed by Ken Yang. No, you have to work very hard to find a building by Ken amongst the skyscrapers of, of Kuala Lumpur. He's doing wonderful things, but he's scratching the surface. He is a blip on a blip on a blip, as, as uh, John Berry characterized it just before the tea break. <coughs> and it seemed to me it was an absolute tragedy to see the apparatus of the air-conditioned box with all of its environmental implications being adopted as a stock solution to virtually every problem, office buildings, hotels, shopping malls. And in one office I visited, I was visiting Cardiff students in their offices in their year out. In one office, one of my students was working on a 3,000 square meter air-conditioned bungalow. Would you believe? <laughs> no. Um, so the question is, where to discover an idea which may have the power to inspire the kind of transformation demanded by Mumford. An idea that will work with the aspirations of the newly dominant economies. And I came again back very much chastened by the fact that they are the dominant economies, we are not anymore. And, and, the, and, and that won't be interpreted by them as a constraint upon what they see as their legitimate and proper aspirations. Now, writing a few years ago, Bruce Anderson in a book called Solar Building Architecture, which is a review of the outcome of the American government's passive solar program in the late 80s. Um, Anderson pointed out that in all the principal population centers of the globe, the envelopes of buildings receive many times more ambient energy than they consume in all of their processes. Ironically, and we've heard this, of course, in the last session very much, even the best solar buildings only tap a tiny fraction of that energy and most buildings consume delivered energy in order to reject it. That seems to me to be an astonishing situation. Thereby, modern cities are of necessity sustained by a far-flung far energy hinterland and infrastructure. London is sustained by the North Sea, is sustained by the Middle East. We have power being generated from all sorts of sources, remote from, from London itself. We have wars to preserve that, 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 that supply. We have industrial disputes, in some ways engendered, in some case, ways otherwise, in, in order to, 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 to create a situation where energy, those energy supplies are, are conserved. Now, that's a very different situation from my one slide. This, this very simple diagram from about 1840, um, a German urban theoretician, Johann Heinrich von Thunen, um, proposed this model of the isolated state. The top half of it simply shows a city made up of concentric rings. The black blob in the middle is a city. The, the, uh, the other annular rings pr produce the necessary support for that city, a truly sustainable city in that sense. The bottom half shows how that model is modified by the existence of a navigable river and so on. But what we have is the city at the center. The first ring outside of that is horticulture and dairying, of course, bringing in the daily food, the perishables, into that city. And then we go out into other rings of other forms of agriculture. But the ring immediately outside horticulture is silviculture. And silviculture, of course, is forestry. And in that, if the, in, 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 in that vision of a city, silviculture, trees are, of course, the energy source. The energy source is, is, is right at the center of the city. Now, clearly, that's an impossible situation, but compare that with try to draw the equivalent diagram for London now, and where is our energy coming from? So I think it's a very, very interesting thought. Now, I think if we take up the implications of Anderson's observation about the relationship between the amount of energy which hits the side of a building and that which the building consumes, an, an, an amazing prospect opens up. It's already been touched upon in the preceding session. If we can achieve the technical, technological transformation that will allow us more efficiently to convert the energy falling on all of these buildings, then we have the possibility of buildings, and more importantly, of cities which the cities that they collectively constitute becoming not consumers, the question from over here before, before tea, but producers of energy. 
I was particularly struck by Nick Baker's beautiful image of the Cutty Sark in the foreground and Canary Wharf in the distance. And that seemed to me to be a wonderful metaphor for a kind of objective. If we could do that, this complex, spatially extensive energy hinterland and all of its political and economic consequences of all mo modern cities here or in the Pacific Rim would be replaced by a new order of self-sufficiency and sustainability, which may be bold enough to achieve the next great step in the history of the city. We've made a lot of progress in the last quarter of a century in making our buildings better and better and better. Perhaps now it's the time to replace pragmatism of that kind with some kind of vision. So that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction. What I would now like to do is to invite the members of the panel in published sequence, beginning with Corin Mille, and you've all been, had these people introduced you before, to make their contributions, and then as quickly as possible to get to the point where we can open up the debate. Thank you. Thanks. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, it's funny to be standing here in the future session when what I really want to talk about is the present, but uh, I hope that the two things are going to collide. A couple of points I wanted to make um, about solar power and buildings. We've heard a lot of different views about sustainability and where we might be in the future. Um, this is one way of getting there that we can do now. The things about solar power and buildings that attract us to it are you know, various and manifold. One is that it's a lot of, there's a lot of options you can do with it. Essentially, the technology you've got available now can be used for nearly every type of building fabric and the external part of the building. It's very adaptable and it's very uh, flexible. Soon you'll be able to get them in colours as well. Solar power, when rela in relation to uh, an individual building's energy consumption, is a very good way of providing power direct on site um, for dispersed generation. It's, uh, it's not an unknown technology. It's been going for quite a long time. There's been quite a lot of money spent on it, and there's quite a lot of buildings already up. Now, obviously, in, in England, there's about half a dozen, perhaps. I mean, in other countries, there's many, many thousands. So it perhaps seems distant here in the UK, but in other countries, it's much, much more immediate. Um, cost is an issue, certainly with solar power. But this is something that should really be seen as a challenge rather than a, well, it's too expensive, so let's not do it. I mean, that really is a way of not making any progress on any issue at all. I mean, I think that that would have been the same case on any issue like CFCs, for example. I mean, if we sat down and said, well, it's too expensive to replace CFCs, we'd still be using them. The other thing about solar power that interests us in it is that we need a way, or Greenpeace feels that it, in the way it runs its campaigns, to try and change the debate in the outside world. And that is what our role is, which doesn't really reflect on what other people's roles, but we're trying to uh, signal to the world what should be done. So when we send a ship out to sea, when we put an inflatable under a whale, or when we put people on the Brent Spa, we're signaling what people's values are about the environment. We're saying that that activity is wrong. Now with solar, what we think and what we sense with it, and we've just started a campaign that will carry on for many years, is that this will be a way, finally, of signaling from our point of view about what is right. You know, what is right about the future, what, what is, can be done, and we're proving that by having the actions on it. One of the things about all these debates about solar and the future and how we run our cities, what materials we use and everything like that, it's very easy to sit down and say, well, that's going to be jolly good. You know, there's a sort of passive futurism element about this thing, which is it'll all happen one day. And I can tell you that the people who put those arguments across are the people who will actually cause the pollution. If you are Shell, or British nuclear fuels about the future. They'll say, yes, in the 21st century, we'll have hydrogen cars, we'll, you know, we'll have zero emissions houses, we'll have no pollutants, we'll all be working from home. And the scenario is the same. The problem with the difference is that their scenario happens when they just have exhausted their resources, made lots of money, and then in the meantime ruined the planet. So there's a very real need to pull those things forward to the present day and the present reality. And that's why. Um, we want to try and get people involved in solar buildings and solar power because it's a way of changing the debate. Now, we, I haven't got any slides of uh, projects, but I thought I'd show a couple of, of, of uh, pictures of solar buildings to show the strength and the weakness. Now, this first one, I mean, it's, it's quite a dull building, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sit and say it's beautiful. Um, that is a solar facade that provides, I think it's about five or six kilowatts of uh, solar power. And the majority of solar buildings are pretty dull, pretty boring. I mean. 
Um, you would probably would have had a, a, a window facade in that uh, building anyway, but that one is PB. Can I get the next one, please? Incidentally, that's a, a, it's a Greenpeace warehouse. This is something maybe a bit more interesting, where um, the way that it's been designed has been put on it. Um, and the next one, please. And that's really, to be honest, when I tried to look at some slides both for this presentation and both for the report that we've done on solar, finding a beautiful one or something that, that isn't ugly is very hard work. And I, I, aesthetics is a very subjective thing, but uh, to me that shows something a bit more different, a bit more exciting. So the challenge with solar is several things. Firstly, to forget about the fact that it's going to happen in the future, but that it's going to happen now. Secondly, for people involved in the building industry, and for architects who influence it to a great extent, is to say, how can I use this technology? What are the options available in each client, in each spec, in each contract to use it, not to dismiss it out of hand, and find ways of actually using it? And if all of the building projects that we look at, we can find a way of incorporating solar, then that really has an influence and in change in things. So it's a challenge to architects about that in that regard of solar, of using it, of being inventive about it, of using your skills in it, and finding for us, you know, we, we have just started this campaign, and finding people that are going to work on this issue with us or outside of it that are going to promote it. But the challenge is an open one. If you want to work on solar, we'll work with you. If you don't want to do it, we'll find someone else. But in closing, that's why we did this report. Now, I, I only brought about 20, and there's lots of you in here. I can send it to people if you want to. This summarizes the case about solar. We sent it to many architects. What we're hoping is to say, this is what should be done. This is how you can do it. This is who you ring up to find out how you do it. And uh, hopefully, we'll start to see a bit of movement. Thanks. I think it would be better if we, if we continue with the presentations, and, and if you can store up your questions until uh, comments until we get to the end. So next we have Roger Kelly. Um, right. Um, well, I'm going to dodge the political and economic issues again, and and concentrate on on some specifics. I've got five slides, and one fairly simple thesis. The first slide, please. Now, the thesis is essentially that for the past hundred years, the engineering of buildings and settlements has been dominated by the physical and chemical sciences. In other words, they are dominated by manufactured materials and mechanical systems for servicing them. And my thesis is that in the coming century, it's going to be the turn of biological science, by which I don't mean that physics and chemistry won't have any part to play, they clearly will, but that biology will have an equal part to play, possibly a greater part to play. Now part of this is going to be something that's been touched on by a number of people so far, this breakdown between the urban-rural dichotomy and the bringing of the experience that have been gained by the people I mentioned in my first little piece, the people who retreated back into the countryside, bringing their knowledge and experience back into the cities again and applying them in an urban context. And already I see, talking to people, I don't live in a city myself, but I talk a lot to people who do, and they're already beginning to uncover and rediscover the landscape that lies underneath cities and look at ways in which that landscape can break through um, the fabric, the urban fabric that's been laid over top of it so that woods and streams begin to reappear and beyond that buildings become more and more like living organisms. So I see buildings in the next century having essentially a durable and long-lasting shell. Oh, sorry, that's, that's actually the last slide. So perhaps you can, if you can run them back to... Yeah, that's the one. It doesn't matter too much, actually. Um, so buildings with a durable shell, which can be the existing shell of a building or a new shell created for the purpose, that shell synthesizing sunlight to provide heat and electricity to the shorter-lived but recyclable or biodegradable internal organs and an electronic central nervous system. Air movement being channeled and diverted to provide passive ventilation. We've already touched on that. Rain being collected and added to purified wastewater to complete that uh, water cycle. Again, all of these things have been touched on 
on a smaller scale uh, and mostly in a rural context. The boundary between the internal and external landscape, I believe, will become increasingly blurred. Can I have the next slide, please? As buildings fill with plants, water, birds, insects, and waste, heat, and exhaust gases accelerate plant growth, and food crops are exported from buildings as pollution and waste once were. Now, I'm just reminded of something that Brenda Vale said before lunch about the system in her house where she had a Clivus composting toilet and the compost from that was used to grow tomatoes in the house. It's happening already. There's no earthly reason why the same thing shouldn't happen on a large scale within urban settlements so that buildings become an essential part of the food production system and don't rely on the rural hinterland for all their food needs. Now there are three strands of thinking which are leading me to believe that biology is going to um, be supreme in the next century. Next slide, please. The first is the permaculture movement. Now, this is essentially what we've been calling alternative technology, but wrapped up in another name and focused very much on integrated, sustainable, organic food production systems, but bringing into that the design of buildings, energy systems, and waste management. Um, and this is essentially an example. It's a food growing area. It's got uh, low energy buildings. It's got its renewable energy systems providing all the energy for it. It's got reed bed sewage treatment systems which feed their effluent into a polytunnel growing more food and the whole cycle repeats itself. It is a completely self-contained development. Again, that's in a rural area. There's no earthly reason why it should be in an urban situation. Now, the permaculture movement is at the moment firmly embedded in um, what's essentially a rural subsistence economy, um, but its thinking is going to move into urban settlements. The second strand is one which is probably more familiar, the building biology movement, which started analyzing sick building syndrome, why buildings contributed to the ill health of their occupants. And from that, there's developed a whole new industry in building materials um, which has turned its back on synthetic uh, chemical manufacture and gone back or gone forward to using plant and naturally occurring many mineral constituents. Have the next uh, slide please. And this is just an example of some work we've, we've done in the past with VSO people on producing corrugated roofing materials out of lowly available basically plant-based uh, materials. And the third strand is um, one that's coming out of work that someone called John Todd is doing in the northeast of the United States on what he calls living machines. Now this is in many ways the most exciting element of it. Um, they're basically carefully designed and engineered aquatic ecosystems for treating waterborne toxins. Now it's a development from the idea of reed bed sewage treatment, but much more complex, and it's involving fauna as well as flora in a complete ecosystem. And they are actually finding that they can clean up some of the most toxic watercourses in the United States using these engineered ecosystems. And some of them have been installed as the centerpieces of, of new buildings already. So these, I think, are the, only the tip of an iceberg of solutions engineered by ecological science. Have the next slide for the creation of a sustainable built environment. That's, that final slide is just the final step. From an architect's point of view, The first slide, please. The, um, I think small-scale diffuse initiatives aren't going to be enough to change the pattern of urban development on their own and create a sustainable architecture. We believe that major public infrastructure projects are really going to be a key component of sustainable cities of the future. We need these city-scale interventions, and I think it's shameful that London has no integrated policy for 
um, energy policy or any um, transport or planning policy. The, what I'm going to talk about in particular are the transportation routes, which really provide the prime link between the city and its hinterland and the, and the world beyond, and the, which at the moment is a very problematic relationship in that the transport routes are really the conduit for all the, um, for the sort of parasitic relationship between the city and, and the hinterland behind. Um, and they're really the conduits for much of the city's wasteful exploit exploitation of natural resources and the failure to, of them to recycle waste. And what we're interested in is how they could be rehabilitated to stimulate the renewal of the existing fab urban fabric in a green way. And what I'm going to show you is an illustration, is in fact a project that we are asked to look at by the city of Rome and uh, Italian railways. And uh, I think it's interesting that uh, um, this is part of the uh, Millennium Project uh, for uh, Italy. It's the Jubileo, which is the, um, the 2000th birthday of the Catholic Church. They remind us that actually the Millennium only comes about because of the Catholic Church. But um, they, uh, they, they, in fact, are investing a lot of money in uh, public infrastructure. And I think it's extraordinary that uh, the lottery money and all the Millennium celebrations of Britain are just on... Uh, entertainment and projects you know, of a much lighter nature, but they see this as an opportunity to regenerate the, the structure of the city, and there's a new administration in Rome, which is a very um, uh, green um, administration. And um, So we, we were asked to propose a number of ideas on how the renewal of the city's transport infrastructure could become a catalyst for this sustainable urban development on a wider scale. And at the moment, they have all the problems that you see in a lot of capital cities where you've got the railways that sort of cut an enormous slice through the city. There's the uh, tangentiale motorway that goes around the, around the city, often ele elevated um, roads, which uh, are, are an enormous barrier through, through the city. And what they, they asked us to contribute some ideas as to how it could be, um, could be reinterpreted and re reformed. Um, next slide, please. And uh, the proposal was for an integrated road and public transport spine based around the existing road routes. And the, the idea was that we would t take this ring system where the railways in Rome fo form a ring around the perimeter, very similar to what happens in, in London. And um, that it would, this ring would become a sort of interceptor to intercept cars and uh, private transport towards the city centre and really transfer the occupants to trains and trams and buses. Next slide, please. And the, this would also become a linear model for sustainable development using renewable energy sources to power both the buildings and the transport systems on the spine. So we saw this starting. In fact, there's a Tabutina station that's going to become the primary station in, in Rome, the main uh, intercity international station instead of Terni. So we saw that as being the place where this, you would plant this organic urban well, this uh, uh, urban organism, which would then grow around the ring and sustain and become an example for how you should uh, um, repair the city and, and provide more sustainable development. Um, next slide, please. I think, you know, the analogy in many, many ways is a bit like the great Victorian drainage projects, you know, for example, the embankment, which um, rehabilitated the river, which was an open sewer, and I see the railways and the motorways in Rome like the equivalent of the open open sewer that um, the, the, the Thames was once. But the embankment in many ways did a fantastic um, job as something that uh, changed it from a sewer into uh, by taking all the, all the drainage away and also made it into a linear parkway and a services route and a transportation spine. And here we have a transport route, but that could also um, become a conduit for uh, green development and also a conduit for the um, uh, for the waste of the city and take it out and, re and return it to the hinterland behind to, um, uh, to fertilize it. So th this shows the project that we, we were doing but, and uh, how it would form a sort of primary ring of the transport network could, that could then transfer people into the city. Next slide, please. And uh, this shows the, that cars would be, be intercepted, um, held in, in car parks that... Uh, and that would really hold the uh, city centre free of public traffic, and then there would be a tran you could transfer people by means of a photovoltaic-powered tram system to 
um, stations and, and public transportation. And really each um, crossing of the, of the ring would become a, a point where you intercept the private cars. Next slide, please. And the, this showed how we were, because the railway is mainly lower, that we would be bury um, the, all the transportation underground and cover it over with a linear park running around the city with the um, photovoltaic canopy, which could then power this uh, tram system. And it's interesting that a lot of Italian cities already have experiments on uh, uh, electric tram and bus systems uh, in there's research into the use of photo photovoltaics since the climate is so well adapted to it. Next slide, please. And then on that spine, you could generate um, uh, new uh, structures, new, new buildings, which would themselves be exemplary buildings as to how you can um, uh, carry out de development along this, this linear parkway. Um, using the, basically the, the upper surface would receive all the energy of the sun and create energy to support the spine itself, but also the activities in what, what are really wastelands, the railway sidings and transport depots are really wastelands, and they could, it could be used to regenerate it both um, in terms of energy and in terms of, the, um, uh, and in terms of cultural and public activities. The next slide, please. And what we, we saw was that you could... Um, Take, you, you could take the, the waste from the city along the spine and return it to the land. And um, you could also use the spine to fuel the district heating system, which could become a conduit for energy and more efficient methods of gener generating energy. Next slide, please. And I think what, what we, we'd like to propose is, you know, couldn't the same happen if there was the political will and to in, in London and other cities that you could resurrect and transform what were the hated motorway box projects of, uh, around London into something which is a positive uh, catalyst for renewable development for, for the main cities in Europe. Thank you. It's hard to see recession for me to keep bobbing up and down to introduce these people, but Godfrey Boyle now. Um, future, where do we go now? Okay. Do you manage to get some overheads this time? I'd like to start by talking about things that we could start doing immediately or nearly immediately. And one of the first things I think we need to start doing is start implementing Agenda 21 instead of just talking about it. This implies, of course, conservation of energy and materials and recycling, long life goods with replaceable components, biodiversity, and the maximum use of renewable resources. And that brings me to the area that I know most about, namely renewable energy. Could I have the first slide, please? Um, this is one example of a renewable energy system, not so much for space heating as you architects tend to talk mostly about, but both for space heating and water heating. This is an interseasonal solar district heating scheme in Denmark where you have a very large array of solar thermal collectors in, and in which the energy is stored from the summer when it's available to the winter when it's needed. This provides energy for an estate of um, several hundred houses and is quite effective. It's backed up by a small combined heat and power plant on the, for those times when there isn't sufficient energy from the sun. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, like everyone else, um, I'm interested in photovoltaics. Um, and these are a few examples of photovoltaics in buildings. Um, the bottom one in the middle is one that we monitored in Milton Keynes. This was actually the first building-mounted photovoltaic project in the UK in 1986, 10 years ago, still in operation. There was a, a nearby wind turbine, which isn't very successful, but the PV plant's working quite well. Um, the s system on the top is the uh, Kastrikim House in, in the Netherlands, which had the distinction of still flourishing and, prov and being the only house that was lit in the locality when there were power cuts. Uh, uh, the, the building on the left is the Scheidegger building in Switzerland, which is a com combination of solar, electric, and space heating modules on the southern facade of the building. And the house on the right is the Eco Energy House in Japan. 
Um, since we tend to feel that there is not a great deal happening in photovoltaics in the UK, and it's true that there hasn't been until recently, but some of us are involved in a new project which we hope will get funding from the Department of Trade and Industries um, uh, Technology Foresight Initiative. It involves most of the UK photovoltaics companies and several academic institutions in Greenpeace. And uh, we're hoping to get something like five million pounds to install photovoltaic systems in several hundred schools and colleges throughout the UK as a demonstration of what can be done. So even in, in Britain, something might start happening quite soon. We hope to hear the results of the application in June of this year. Can I have the next slide, please? This is, um, oh, wrong one, anyway. Um, this is uh, some long-term future energy scenarios that have been produced by various bodies. Uh, the top left scenario shows that even in the opinion of the relatively conservative World Energy Council who produced that scenario, it's quite feasible for renewable energy sources to be producing something like half the world's energy in all forms by the year 2100. The two right-hand scenarios are from a team of experts in the United Nations under Thomas Johansson who reported to the Rio Earth Summit that in their opinion we could achieve something like 50% from renewables worldwide by about 2050, i.e. in just over 50 years from now. And the, the bottom left scenario is one from our friends in Greenpeace who produced a very ambitious and impressive fossil-free energy scenario a few years ago, which showed the technological possibility of, in fact, phasing out all fossil and nuclear fuel use by the end of the next century and replacing it with a mixture of solar, uh, wind, and biofuels, and, and the details of that are in a very fat report that they produced. Uh, and these scenarios, I should stress, all rely on relatively conventional assumptions about population growth and economic growth. They all assume that the world population reaches something like 11 billion, by about twice the present level, by the end of the next century, and also that world economic growth increases to something like 14 times the present GDP uh, by the year 2100. Teddy was telling us earlier that world economic growth had increased by about a factor of 10 in the last 45 years. Well, these scenarios assume another factor of 10 at, at least. And the Greenpeace people, of course, point out that this isn't necessarily considered desirable by any means, but it, it um, is something which they adopted in order to be compatible with other studies. The Greenpeace scenario also, by the way, as does the UN one, also makes allowance for considerably increased equity between the North and the South. Okay. Um, I need the other slide, thanks. Um, I'd like to go back, though, to the fact that we aren't going to get anywhere with all this technology if there aren't going to be major political changes. And I think that one of the most important changes that's required, and a very simple one, is to implement the subsidiarity principle, which is what we already pay lip service to in the European Union, but which is only really implemented in a very nominal way in the United Kingdom by devolving powers to the nation state level, which is hardly going far enough. Um, we think, I think we need a great, much greater devolution of power and resources in the UK. Um, if I can also borrow a phrase from the Labour Party, I believe there was somebody from the Labour Party supposed to be here today, but he didn't turn up, or he's coming next week or something. But uh, I mean, I don't think we should allow the Labour Party to entirely monopolize the, the phrase stakeholder society, that they didn't invent it, and it's nice to know that they've adopted it recently. But um, I think that it is a very powerful idea, an idea whose time perhaps has started to come. And stakeholding, I think, needs to be applied in the workplace to uh, find ways of involving employees, customers, and the wider community, as well as, well as shareholders in the running of enterprises. I think we also need to encourage many more cooperative and community and municipal enterprises in the future. These things happen in other countries and they're considered something rather exotic here, but it's perfectly normal in, in many other countries. We also do need to find ways of giving meaningful employment to people and an adequate basic income, otherwise we're going to have riots in the street before now, certainly if the sorts of things that Teddy Goldsmith was talking about earlier tend to, uh, uh, begin to happen. Um, employment is an issue that's been explored very sensibly by um, people like Jeremy Rifkin and Andre Gortz. We also need stakeholding the community, more um, cooperatives in the housing and co-housing schemes. And finally, I think we need, we need reform.
reforms in the marketplace, we certainly cannot have unregulated free markets. I think markets should be the servants of society, not its master. We need to p curb the powers of the transnational corporations. We also need to moderate this god of free trade, which, which uh, is like many goods in society, is not an unalloyed good. Um, I think some limits to that would be justifiable and some protectionist measures might well be necessary and desirable. Um, I'm being asked to stop now, so I'll stop now. Except, can I just finish with one, what I thought was inspiring quote from um, Norman Myers in his epilogue to the Gaia Atlas. Said, in case we've been getting too depressed in these discussions, he says that we may well in future years look back in the present time as a point when signs of hope were springing forth in all kinds of unexpected places. We have the chance, he says, quite simply to be the first to live in final accord with our spaceship Earth and hence in final, final harmony with each other. The ancient Greeks, the Renaissance communities, the founders of America, the Victorians enjoyed no such challenge as this. What a time to be alive. Oh, I forgot to plug my book. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to invite Mosin now briefly to in offer one or two pointers for the discussion debate, which we hope will then occupy as long as you want, really. Um, please. Thank you, Dean. Um, I really don't want to take more than a couple of minutes. I think we should definitely go to questions. Uh, but really speaking as a total non-expert in a sense in this field, um, there are a couple of sort of uh, reactions to, uh, to the discussion. I've uh, really learned an enormous amount uh, in terms of both general issues and specifics uh, today. But I want initially maybe to uh, return us to the very first session in terms of the relationship between the political and theoretical basis of uh, sustainable architecture and still, in a sense, reiterate a little bit my um, uh, concern or slight anxiety in terms of this uh, constant duality that is set up uh, in, in many of the discussions between the global and the local. Um, and uh, to try and, in a sense, um, support, I think, a little bit of the line of uh, discussion that John Pringle was uh, developing in, in showing their parliament building, that in fact, uh, uh, Often, we don't have necessarily this uh, bipolar opposition, but we're always working in situations which are much more moments of mediation. They're not so clear in terms of either the global or the very specific local. And I think, uh, uh, again, as a sort of further reminder of that, I think the, some, of the, some of the issues that uh, Philip referred to in terms of the city as the domain of interaction, the city as the uh, site of relationship between uh, the actual urban fabric and the whole question of citizens and the, the right of citizens and so on, uh, I think that we still need to further articulate and specify this uh, issue of decentralization in relation to what it means in conjunction with, with the city and the rights of citizens in a sense. Because I think that there is an aspect of it, despite the, the, uh, the uh, insurance in a sense that I was uh, uh, given and the assurance that I was given by, by Mike uh, that uh, uh, there are in fact different political, um, political aspirations related to this, to this issue of decentralization. I think we have to be very clear uh, what it means in terms of us taking certain responsibility for the citizens in relation to questions of housing, in relation to other activities for, for those people who are really not able to return to this notion of the individual and the idea of specific, very small scale communities. So I think that there is something to be said about slightly bigger than smaller scale communities. And I think that would be an interesting thing to, to, to touch on in relation to the, the role of the city and its connection to the issue of decentralization as a topic. Uh, one other thing I think uh, is related to this discussion of performance. Um, many of the um, presenters were very clear in terms of the whole issue of technical performance and the gains that have been made in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, specific uh, building conditions and, and uh, in relation to, to, to the issue of technical performance. I'd like to propose that as well as technical performance, it would be really quite worthy or uh, worthwhile to consider uh, the topic of performance in a slightly different way, 
something maybe more analogical to the way in which we discuss performance in the theater, the, the whole concept of performativity, which is more to do with also the way in which buildings are used uh, in terms of everyday events as well as their technical performativity. And I think if we did that, um, we would begin to make a slightly different set of connections between, th between technological advancements and architectural spatialities. I'll just give you a, as one tiny example to try and make this thing specific. Recently, I've just done a, a piece on, on the issue of mass-produced windows. And one of the things that in, in talking to the manufacturers in the United States about mass-produced windows is that really most of the advances have been made from the point of view of energy efficiency and in terms of cost reduction. But many of these, these uh, advances also come at the cost of, for example, uh, increasing the thickness of the mullions and so on and so forth. Immediately, these gains have certain repercussions in terms of what the window looks like, what the window is as a thing in its own right. And I wonder, again, in terms, of connecting th in terms of connecting the issue of technical performance to the idea of performativity, whether we can't discuss uh, these issues much more specifically, which I, I thought was, was something that John, again, was trying to get at in his criticism of, of the kind of idealization of the conditions of sustainability in relation to some of the, some of the projects. Uh, just in terms of a, a kind of a more positive uh, uh, suggestion to do with where do we go now, I, and, and tying that back to the, to the discussion of the city, I very much believe that um, the issue of landscape and sites of reclamation in the city, it seems to be a very interesting topic uh, for us to, uh, to discuss uh, because it begins to precisely address this middle ground. It isn't to do with, the, again, the idealization of and setting up certain uh, very particular conditions independent of the city, but addresses what has happened to the city as a result of certain 19th century advancements so that things like the railway yards and so on can now be seen much more as a project of healing in some sense, which I think also goes back a little bit to what Gustav Metzger was uh, touching on in, in terms of his discussion of, of nature. One could also see, in a sense, the notion of reclamation uh, a little bit um, in that light. And I think the consideration of the city as a sort of landscape of sustainability can itself also be seen in, in, in terms of a, a kind of critique of a certain history of planning, which we've, uh, we've inherited. So basically what I'd like to propose is that we open up the discussion of sustainability a little bit, uh, not confuse it immediately with the, with the issue of the individual and spirituality and, and really discuss it much more specifically in terms of the ethics of sustainability in the, and, and if possible in the context of, of our uh, cities. So. It's up to you now. Um, there are microphones, or a mic there's a microphone. So who would like to <coughs> begin? This is impossible. Nick, Nick Baker over there, then Hugo Hinsley over here, and then the other hands. Right at the far corner. Is there a microphone near you, Nick? Yeah, I'd just like to pose the question to the panel. What do they feel would be the outcome if alternative energy sources became so efficient that there was unlimited energy to use in our buildings. Who would like to respond to that? Well, uh, I don't want to answer it solely, but uh, it, it's an issue that um, has fascinated me uh, for a very long time, which is th this one that inside all of us, I think, we believe that somehow or other, if somebody could invent a little black box that provided us with all the energy we needed, which was non-polluting, free, and endless, that would solve all our problems. And the more I study it, the more I realize that it won't, because obviously there is a fairly direct relationship between the use of energy in any form and environmental destruction. Uh, you can power your chainsaw by renewable sources, and it's still going to um, chop down rainforests at exactly the same rate. Um, in fact, the first example that was given me to illustrate this was about the fishing industry, that as soon as um, um, uh, fishermen had the availability of a motor on their, their boat, they ranged wider, they caught more fish, and so uh, depletion of fish stocks took place. Now, that, that motor on their boat, it, I mean, it could have been a, a high-tech sailing boat that did it. 
but it's the use of the energy in the first place that's having that destructive effect. So my simple answer to your question is that uh, it's not the answer. And um, I think this is one of the problems with a lot of the scenarios that are produced about energy futures, that it assumes that we want as much energy as we can get. And I don't believe this is the case. I think we have to look very, very carefully at why we need energy in any particular situation. Anyone else on the panel would like to make a contribution? Anyone from the floor like to make a contribution? I just want to say, I think it would be great, actually, if we get a lot of energy from renewables. I mean, that's the whole point. We're talking about eliminating potent sources of pollution from nuclear and fossil fuels. These, these two things threaten our whole planet, our whole existence, and it's a race against time to get rid of them. Now, the question about what you do when you have a lot of renew renewable energy will be a complex one, but I think it would be nice to actually be in that situation rather than imagine what it would be like you know, it's, 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 it's thinking about what might happen if these things happened. But we've got to make sure that, that we get to that point. Anyone else on the panel? Uh, I, I, I've long been fascinated by the, 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 the vision of William Morris in News From Nowhere, where there is a society which has invisible sources of energy. It's rather a frugal society. Energy is never discussed. Clean, silent ships float along the, the clean Thames with uh, against, the, against the stream, you know, with salmon leaping and so on. But of course, what that means is that there has to be a vision of society which is in some way detaches itself from this question of energy in, in, in precisely that way. Um, Hugh, ne next, Hugo uh, has another comment. Uh, the news from nowhere reminds me, of course, of the whole issue of utopianism, and it's something that concerns me in, in, in these discussions. Uh, after the first session, I, I think I felt fairly battered and, and overwhelmed at the sort of scale of issues and challenges that were represented and, and, and the very difficult questions. After the, the, the middle sessions, where there's a great deal of discussion about tex technical fixes and different ways in which particularly the design professions are involved in technical attempts to deal with some of the issues, one could feel more optimistic. But, but uh, the last session again brings us back to the issue of the political and of the scale of what we're talking about. And I think both as designers and as citizens, there are issues of, of scales of intervention and what we can actually realistically do. By the political, I think we have to be very careful how we define what we're talking about. The political is just as much about issues raised through questions of Agenda 21 and really trying to find a low local level of political knowledge information and uh, discussion just as much as the much more depressing issues of, of the GATT treaties and, and the uh, disparaging comments about uh, the Rio summit and so on. And it's, it seems to be immensely difficult as professionals, the people who are actually involved in, in design, to hold all of that stuff in our heads uh, at the same time that we're dealing with making buildings or you know, working at a local level. So the question to the panel really is, is there was a sense in the first session of almost a dismissal of that larger scale, and that the Rio summit was a waste of time or very marginal in its usefulness, that Agenda 21 is a bit of a fantasy uh, and it's really impossible to take it any further, <laughs> uh, and that uh, there could be a tendency to think, well, we perhaps we should just concentrate on sorting out some technical problems within our own skill limits uh, and not worry too much about the political. So uh, I'd like to sort of bring that up again. Thank you very much. Anyone like to respond to that? I guess that I think we need to work on the technical issues, and many of us, some of us are indeed working on developing the technologies both in buildings and in renewable energy and in other spheres of ecological technology. But at the same time, I feel we're not going to get all the way or anything like all the way with those things without there being significant political changes. And I didn't particularly, I myself, particularly mean to be disparaging about either Rio or Agenda 21. I think they were actually quite valuable exercises. Agenda 21 certainly seems to be having effects in many local authorities in the UK where many councils seem to be genuinely trying, striving within admittedly a very cash-strapped situation to do something and it would, as I've said myself, uh, help a lot if our present government in the UK would just loosen things up a bit and devolve some authority and resources back to local government again. So. I kind of feel we can, we, we need those of us who are involved professionally in technology or architecture to yes, try and do what we can within our professions. But then as citizens outside those professions, we need to agitate for political changes at the local, the regional, the national, and the international level. 